Hi, this is Ronald Johnson, your life coach, mentor coach. And what I do is I help people that are tired of who they are and where they are in life. And this is Gloria, your life coach. I help those who are feeling stuck, struggling with difficulties such as self-doubt, inner judgment, lack of confidence, life transitions, and taking steps forward. And welcome to Life's A Shuffle podcast. Now, you may wonder why it's called Life's A Shuffle. And the reason why we came up with this title was that life is really shuffling. And it doesn't matter where you come from, your background, what age you are, you're shuffling multiple things in life. And the best thing to know in life is everybody faces your struggles and everybody faces what you're going through. But there's hope in learning something about that. So when our guests share their journey, the hope is you learn something in that journey so yourself can navigate the struggles you face, the low self-esteem, the self-confidence. And that's why we call podcast Life's a Shuffle. And throughout this podcast, we share our personal overcoming stories, as well as our guests who shares their personal journey in overcoming their personal struggles. Life's a Shuffle podcast is here to connect like-minded individuals. And thank you for listening to Life's a Shuffle podcast. Hi, this is Gloria, your mindfulness and meditation coach. Welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. Hi, this is Ronald Johnson, your behavior mindset coach and positive psychology practitioner. And welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. And it's Saturday. I'm super excited. The weather is fine. Sunshine's out. A lot of places in the United States. And we're with another special guest. And she was a great friend in IPEC, where Gloria and I went to, to life coaching school. And we're continuing our journey around this universe at the same time. I want to say, Patty Shives, thank you for taking the time out to be a guest on Life of Shuffle podcast and to express your story. This is a safe space for you. And I look forward to hearing whatever you have to share. The thank floor you so is all much, yours. Ron. Thank you so much, Ron. And I have to say, I'm very honored and grateful to be invited to talk to you. And I'm also I have so much gratitude for the opportunity to meet both of you as well as all of our colleagues at IPAC last year. It truly was a life-changing experience for me. And it and it really kind of gave me the experience with learning about coaching that I had hoped it would be. And so it's really an honor to be here today and share this with you. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah, welcome, Patty. Thank you. So when when we first talked and you asked me to share my story. I started thinking about what value, if any, I could add to uh, you and your listeners um, in in the light of how you are driving your podcast. And I started thinking that, you know, I I do truly believe everything in our lives uh, that we experience uh, directly relates to getting us to where we are today. And that includes both the goods and the bads and the tragic. And I have to say, As I look back on my journey, uh, everything has prepared me for where I am today. I actually grew up in Colorado. My father worked for the Air Force Academy just out of Colorado Springs. And uh, we grew up there for many, many years until about the age of 15 when my dad had an offer to go to work with NATO overseas. And so he accepted that role. And we started our journey to England, where my dad worked with NATO as a civilian, and we uh, ended up living in Europe for almost 10 years, going back and forth between England and Germany. So I moved there when I was about 15, ended up going to both high school and college in England, which was quite a culture shock if you've never experienced it. And it was pretty uncomfortable at the time, but I think it was one of the few things that started to shape who I am today, because it taught me about self-sufficiency. When I went to school in England, I had to go to boarding school. It was the first time I was taken away from my parents. I had to fend for myself. Uh, There was also a pretty rigorous uh, education curriculum. So it raised uh, the level of my education pretty substantially. And I was grateful for that also. But it also uh, gave me an amazing opportunity to travel the world, which I had never thought I would get. And the experiences and the exposures that I had to multiple cultures 
uh, at a very interesting time in history, um, you know, during the 70s and the 80s, uh, was really amazing for me. And I, I was really fortunate. I, I had a great high school uh, experience. I ended up having a scholarship out of high school. But I also realized I wasn't quite ready yet to decide on a career. So after graduation, I took the opportunity to travel all over Europe. And I decided to take a couple of years to uh, just experience life, but also to start working in some of the professions that I found interesting. And so I was able to work in banking and in many of the industries that interested me. And I was so glad that I did that because it was really eye-opening and it made me start thinking about how, you know, as, as kids, we expect kids to make decisions about the rest of their professional life when they're 18 and just out of school and have had no experience in life. And so I was really glad that I had that chance because after about four years, I did decide that it was time to go to school and ended up going back to England to do that. And uh, got three degrees in three years, um, business, uh, liberal arts, European and British history. And all of those were really fascinating for me. And they also, I think, prepared me for a life in business. So after I graduated, I came back to the U.S. and started working in Silicon Valley. And what better place to be baptized in business than in Silicon Valley? I mean, it's just a plethora of opportunities and an opportunity to work work with amazing people who are so innovative and smart and curious. And I was so glad that I kind of landed in that area and started working in business in Silicon Valley and uh, got into HR. Uh, I first was in sales for the first seven years of my career, and then I migrated into HR. And I really found my, my spot at that point because it was, you know, working with I think the engines that make every company tick and they're engines that can't really be, you know, fixed or predicted, you know, we're as humans, we're a wily group. So it's always challenging to work with the humans that drive our corporations. And so I have always found it fascinating. And that started what has become a sort of 20, 25 year career in human resources. And about halfway through my career, I decided that I was interested in coaching and so for the last uh, sort of 10, 12 years, I had been looking for a really great coaching uh, uh, school that I could go to because while I had, I had done coaching throughout my career, I realized that what I was lacking was a structure in coaching. And so I uh, really appreciated that opportunity with IPEC to learn a structure and a methodology. And I think that has made you know both my HR work as well as my coaching much stronger. But I think you know one of the other things that has really shaped my life was that about 15 years ago, I was uh, just standing in my bathroom in my sink, washing my face, and I all of a sudden felt something pop on the top of my head. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I had actually uh, experienced a brain aneurysm. And oh. it was Ooh. a, yeah, it was a brain aneurysm in the form of a, intracerebral hemorrhagic stroke, which is a huge mouthful. So yes, please explain. <laughs> so You're like a doctor. I, believe me, I know terms now that uh, I never thought I would ever have committed to memory. And uh, I, I didn't realize it at the time, um, but it would change my life completely because uh, the result was that I was paralyzed on my left side. Uh, if you drew a line, a line down my body, everything on the left side was completely dead, uh, lost feeling, lost function. I was really fortunate because usually when you have a brain an aneurysm, you usually have cognitive damage as well. But I, for some reason, uh, I did not have cognitive damage. And I'll speak a little bit about that in a minute because I think it goes also under the topic of everything that happens to you in your past prepares you for where you are. But, um, you know, at the time I was told that, um, you know, I was lucky to be alive. Uh, the kind of aneurysm I had has about an 80% mortality rate. And then they said, you know, if you do manage to survive, you'll, you'll never work again or walk again. So let's talk about how we can help you modify your home and, you know, kind of get help and just get comfortable with being with, in a wheelchair the rest of your life. And, 
at the time I was 42 years old and that's not the kind of thing that you want to hear when you're in, you know, what is the prime of your life. And so I can recall that, that during the time that I was in the rehab hospital uh, where you're lucky to go to, if they think that you have a chance of actually surviving one of these things after about 30 days. Uh, and I was in the rehab hospital and things weren't going well. And I remember saying to myself at that time, I had a pretty uh, uh, direct conversation with myself where I said, you know, look, you've got a choice here. You can fight and work hard to get back on your feet and continue to live your life in a productive way, or you can just stay in this wheelchair and give up and nobody would blame you because this is a pretty catastrophic thing. And I remember I had a bit of, of an epiphany at that point and realized I still had a lot in me. I had a lot to offer. I felt like I hadn't quite realized my full potential and had become a fully re realized human being. And so it was a conscious decision on that day to fight. And I have continued to do that every single day um, since, since that day in the rehab hospital 15 years ago. And I'm happy to say that, um, you know, I was able to get back on my feet. I was able to start walking again. And I also started working again. And not only did I start working, but I was able to carry on with my career at the highest levels of corporate. I also quite regularly travel all over the world. And I have been lucky enough to live pretty normally. And now, you know, things certainly aren't perfect. I still have a lot of work to do. Uh, you never quite get fully recovered from something like this, but, um, and I will have to uh, deal with it the rest of my life, but I'm incredibly fortunate that I was able to get where I was. And I also realized that um, my past has prepared me here because uh, when I was younger, I was a world-class athlete. I learned about how to train and how to get strong and how to have mental endurance. And that is all about recovery when you're trying to recover from this kind of devastating injury. And um, I also discovered something very interesting. And that was when I was a child, uh, we realized that I was actually deaf in one of my ears, in my right mm. ear, as a matter of fact. And uh, they discovered that when I was a toddler, probably two years old. And you know, it was always kind of painful growing up, you know, dealing with a, a, that kind of a hearing disability, but it actually ended up saving me, which is kind of what I was talking about before that, you know, sometimes things prepare you for things in life. And what I discovered is that because I was deaf in my right ear, uh, my neurologist told me that there were whole parts of my brain that got overdeveloped that other people don't develop because my left ear and my brain had to compensate for not hearing on the right side. So uh, I was told that there were areas in my brain that had been overdeveloped uh, out of compensation. And those areas actually were impacted by the aneurysm. And therefore, I was able to actually, um, because they were developed, I was able to actually not experience the cognitive damage that a lot of people uh, experience. So the deafness in my ear, it turns out, actually saved me with the aneurysm, you know, 40 some years later. So I thought that was incredibly fascinating and really prophetic as to why we should honor our history and honor our past and take some of those things that feel like they might be traumatic or negative and take what we learn from them and use them to help us gain strength later on in life. So I'm happy to say I've, you know, worked with everything I have and, you know, hopefully have set a foundation to continue to recover uh, in my life because, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it's going to be something I work with uh, and work to improve forever. But I think now the challenge as I move forward will be how to, uh, how to, to gain and keep balance in life, right? So, you know, how to not work too much, but just enough, how to recover enough, but not too much, how to live and be present uh, and, you know, do that with balance. And I think that will be the next challenge in my life. But I think, again, uh, I'm choosing to fall back on everything that I've ever learned in my life to help me you know, propel forward and continue to learn. So that's just in general, a little a bit of a long intro, intro about who I am and how I got to where I'm at now. No, thank you, Patty. That was an amazing story. It's, um, 
You know, I, I have to think about my life. You know, there's probably things in my life that I went through my 20s that I would not want to experience now. So I'm glad I got out of the way, I guess I would say. Mm-hmm. But in addition to that, all the experience I experienced as in my teens and my childhood and my young adulthood, I'm now embracing those experiences to, to use in my new business for coaching and helping people out. Um, and it realize uh, trauma in some ways can give you your superpower to allow you to do more for yourself or for others. So it's an amazing story there. Um, I had this one question I would ask. When you heard that pop in your brain, did you faint or did you go to the hospital or what happened after that? A good question. I actually, I was, I was washing my face. So I was bent over the sink. And when I stood up, I, I felt this pop. And I remember kind of looking in the mirror and saying to myself, gee, that's odd, right? Because mm. you don't usually feel that in your head. And uh, then I actually watched my left hand just fall and kind of bounce on the sink. And then I started to get dizzy and uh, weak. And I didn't realize at the time that what was happening is, you know, the the synapses were shutting down and I was starting to become paralyzed. So I kind of pivoted and sat down on a seat in the bathroom. And then I promptly slid to the floor and and, and there was a, a basic sort of confusion. I was seeing colors. It was confusing. And I remember thinking to myself, uh, you know, something's not right, but I couldn't put my finger on what it was. I had not lost consciousness, which I found out later was incredibly important. Uh, and I have, I was having, it was weird. It was kind of like my left brain was having a conversation with my right brain. And one side was telling the other, Hey, stay calm, just keep breathing. And then I, funny enough, I recalled an email that I received from one of my relatives a while later, a a little while before this, where it said, you know, when, when you have a stroke, stay calm, you know, breathe calmly. Don't, uh, you know, don't get excited because it could actually, depending on the kind of stroke it is, it could actually be more harmful. And somehow that popped into my brain, right? What, what gifts we have, right? That come right. to us when we need them. And I just remember thinking that's got to be what's happening. And so I started to yell for my parents. Here's the other interesting thing. My parents um, were visiting me for a couple of weeks because my husband had gone to Europe on business. And my mom had said to me, look, I don't want you to, I just have a bad feeling. I don't want you to be alone while your husband's gone. And I kind of, you know, laughed and said, Oh mom, you know, I'll be fine. Well, they had been here for two weeks and they were going to return the next morning. And I remember at dinner that night, we'd had this conversation where I said, see mom, everything's fine. You can go home and safely. And my husband will be back in a couple of days. And, you know, you know, you worried for nothing. And ironically enough, that night is when it happened. Um, you know, while their suitcases were at the door ready to go home and so I was in, in my bathroom and I, I remember yelling for my mom and she was in a different part of the house and couldn't hear me. And I started to have this conversation back and forth in my brain saying, wow, maybe nothing's coming out of my mouth. Maybe I, I think I'm yelling and maybe nothing's coming out. And I thought if I'm going to get to the hospital, I'm going to have to do this myself. So after several times, I kind of fell over onto my stomach. And I remember what was really interesting is at that point, my left arm had completely gone paralyzed and it got stuck under my body, but I couldn't feel it under there. And I kind of grabbed at my hand and it was the strangest thing because it felt like a stranger's hand, right? Like there was no recognition from my brain that I was holding one of my hands. And that was really weird. But I was able to use, um, you know, sort of walls and furniture to kind of, and, and then my good right side to kind of you know, push and pull myself along the floor on my stomach. And I made my way to my dresser. And thank goodness, we still had a landline. I was able to pull the landline off of the dresser. And I actually called 911 myself. So, uh, you know, and luckily, I live in Sunnyvale. And of course, the paramedics there are amazing. They were there in probably five minutes. But um, something in me knew I had a stroke because, you know, when I dialed 911 and the operator answered, she said, what do you think the problem is? And I said, I actually think I had a stroke. And so, of course, they made things happen really quickly. So to answer your question, Ron, what happened after that was a series of very interesting things that I'm really grateful that I was conscious to see because it was um, 
it, it, it was very interesting to watch, which sounds a little bit odd to say, but also I was able to help my doctors to understand what was happening to me as well. So uh, that's what happened. And I'm happy to say I never did lose consciousness, which was, uh, as, I, as it turns out, very lucky because a lot of times people don't actually come back when that mm-hmm. happens. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, you were very alert. And I... <laughs> This is the very first time I've ever heard of actually someone coming back. I had a classmate who just never woke up from it. Mm-hmm. She has brain aneurysm and she's gone. Yeah. Um, but that's, I'm, I'm in shock. Like, I don't know what to say right now because I'm thinking, oh, my God. Yeah. This, and, and, you know. and even the medical profession doesn't doesn't recognize that because I remember when the ambulance got me to the hospital, the very first thing they do. Now, here's the, another reason I'm incredibly lucky and grateful. And that is, uh, I, that, that was around the time that the Bay area was establishing, um, these trauma centers for stroke. And Mm. as it turns out, you know, there are two different types of stroke you can have. One is a hemorrhagic, which is a bleed in the brain, which is far more damaging. And the other one is an ischemic stroke, which is a blockage, right? Where you're, where you have a lack of oxygen to your brain and the treatment for both of them is significantly different. So if you try to treat an aneurysm patient in the same way you treat an ischemic stroke patient, you'll kill them because they're already bleeding in their brain. And if you give them blood thinners, then they're going to bleed out really quickly. And so luckily the medical community is, has figured that out. And so they have a protocol now where they immediately put you into a CAT scan machine and figure out whether you actually have one or the other. And then that determines the treatment protocol. But I remember when I was coming out, this was about 1130, 12 o'clock at night. And when I was coming out of the, a uh, CAT scan machine late at night. There were these two technicians in the room and they didn't think that because it was so bad that I don't think they thought that I was conscious because they were talking amongst themselves. And I heard one of them say, uh, yeah, that doesn't look good. Who, who should we call? I.e. which sur- surgeons should we call? And they started naming names and they're saying, yeah, but you know, he can't be here until the morning. And one of them said, well, that's if she makes it till morning. And I remember when I heard him say that, I was looking around the room wondering, are they talking about me? (laughs) Am I the only one in here? Because I thought, you know, I really, you know, is this what it feels like to die? And, you know, I just, I've got a raging headache, but, you know, I don't feel like I'm going to die. It was just the oddest thing. And then later on, I had people coming up and asking me to speak a lot and to, you know, read letters on a page because, you know, what happens when you have an aneurysm, if you manage to survive the initial bleed, um, then, then you start, your brain start to, starts to deteriorate pretty quickly because blood in the brain is a very toxic substance. So when you have blood in the brain, it starts to, um, you know, it kind of blows up the brain cells. And then that starts a chain reaction where more and more brain cells start to explode. And so I was, uh, you know, I I was expected to significantly deteriorate within 24 hours and possibly die. So, uh, you know, in many ways, you know, the way the treatment protocol works out is great. But as I was saying, even the medical professionals don't believe that you ever have a very high opportunity to survive. Right. So you just never know. Yeah. Wow. It's crazy, isn't it? My dad (laughs) had. It's um... so crazy. (laughs) But yeah, I think my dad had two. It's really hard to say. His 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 health was kind of all over the place. Um, I think he had maybe two aneurysms. I know one mm-hmm. stroke for sure. That's mm-hmm. for sure because that they had the last one, two thousand seven. Is his health just rapidly declined? He started mm-hmm. getting um, dementia, dementia. I'm not sure how to pronounce it correctly. And he started getting a little onset of Alzheimer's. So his temperament was very high and low. And um, before he knew it, he had, you know, he just, his health declined within eight years. He, he was gone. That's just kind of how it went very rapidly. But it's it's funny how some people get the same thing you got, but you have a completely successful life then and after. My dad got the same thing. His health went downhill. And I, I attributed that to a lot of different things. Um, outlook on life, I think, has always been the biggest thing. 
Mm-hmm. Second thing being is that, you know, when you have these kind of issues going on, you, you're just pretty much, um, you're guinea pig. The doctor's going to give you some medicine and hope it works. And sometimes what happens, that medicine enacts C medicine. So they have to give you new C medicine. That C medicine may be stronger and starts killing your, your intestines, your kidneys, all that kind of stuff. So I would say that, I think there will always be the most important one to me, is that as you tend to go through life, you tend to pick up baggage, like like you know, like a magnet, right? Mm-hmm. And the baggage can be friendships, it can be loved ones, it can be significant others. And if you don't tend to get rid of that baggage and take care of your own personal health, it'll weigh you down. Mm-hmm. In this particular case, me, and this is obviously my side in my opinion only, my stepmom wore my dad down. And I think that's why his health declined the fastest. Mm. Um, you know, my stepmom, at least in my perspective as a kid, was she was looking for a golden parachute. And as my dad's health declined, she saw more opportunity for her to gain the upper hand. Now, that can be um, wrong, but that's just my opinion about that. And sometimes in life, you know, you just have to get rid of that magnet, get rid of that dead weight. It, it, it will kill you. And mm-hmm. more importantly, my dad didn't take care of his health. He didn't get back to the basics, which is he liked running outside and jogging or walking. He liked eating healthy. His idea of eating healthy was a chicken sandwich at McDonald's. So I don't know if <laughs> that really is going to work out well. I mean, he would try to take one bun off and eat half the bun. And, but, <laughs> you know, if he had did better of that, I think that would have helped his, his life. You know, and those are all things we can control. Um, and stress. Stress killed him. And my dad had a coach or a therapist or a psychologist, but he's coming from the 50s. So seeking out help outside yourself is kind of taboo. So mm-hmm. that's just kind of those things I think about. But. I enjoy yeah. hearing your story of perseverance, and um, I, I'm just curious how ha- I know it's affected your life, and um, you had a lot of things you had to fight in the last several years, and still fighting it now. How did it affect your family? Were they supportive, or? Yeah, good question. You know, I do think uh, uh, I fully credit my family for helping me. This is something you do not do alone which was a lesson I learned, <laughs> right? I was always very independent and uh, people used to call me the solutions gal because I was always looking for the solution and uh, rarely ever asked for help. And, you know, I was put in a place where I was for the first time ever just forced to ask for and accept help. And I am honored and grateful that my family stepped up. And uh, my husband is, you know, really the hero in this story because, uh, you know, I remember sitting in the hospital, of course, you know, you have a lot of time to think and reflect at that point. Right. And I remember thinking to myself how, how he must be feeling, uh, given that he is, he has a wife who literally 30 seconds before that, uh, was fully capable and, functional and you know we had a life plan together and now that looked like it could potentially go away in a heartbeat and how was he feeling about it and i really tried to understand how it was to be in his shoes and that was one of the things that really made me decide to fight right to get up and fight every day because i didn't want to leave my husband with the burden of caring for somebody so early in life that needed a hundred percent care. So um, having said that I am to this day, I am continuously humbled about his kindness and his generous spirit and how he fought for me. You know, when you're in the hospital, it's, it's a bunch of little things, but you have, you truly need an advocate, right? You need somebody who will fight for you. You need somebody who will advocate for you And he was my fierce warrior and I will forever be grateful. And to this day, 15 years later, he is as well. And, you know, my commitment is I do my part every day to get up and fight. Because like you said, with your dad, you know, know, sometimes it's twice as hard when you're in this kind of condition to get up and just move across the room. So, you know, keeping yourself moving is 10 times harder than you when, when you're able-bodied. And so, you know, he continues to be that rock for me when, when I start to get worn out and, you know, my mental game may slip a little bit and he's there for me. Uh, My mom also was amazing. She um, actually stayed with me for about three months. She, she left her job and she actually cared for me at my home, far away from her home. 
And, um, and I'm, I cannot, I, I just, to this day, I cannot tell her how grateful I am for her doing that. So I had a huge amount of help and continue to do it to this day. You know, hearing that it's, I could, I could only imagine what it was like for them. I mean, I can't speak for them, but I can almost feel like I know what it feels like, you know, just showing up and showing you how strong they are, but deep down it's very hard for them. Mm-hmm. It was very hard for them to see you and mm-hmm. she was trying to get you out of there. And I remember I was thinking back when my mom um, was in the hospital and she had a heart attack and I remember walking into the ICU you know, again, it was like yours, right? Given like 24 hours, if she wakes up, yeah, she survives. If she doesn't wake up within that 24 hours, that's pretty much it. And I remember just standing there, I could not cry. Like I was thinking, oh my God, what just happened? I was just talking to her, you know, yeah. just like your situation. And I'm thinking she just started having, she, she just started having this pain in her back. And next thing I know, she's in the hospital. The next thing I know, she's in the ICU and she has all these tubes on her. So I actually literally stood in front of that door for 10 minutes, just staring. And the doctors and the nurses was talking to me, but I could hear their voices. I did not understand what they were saying. Oh, it was like, wow, 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 wow. Right. Because I was, sta- I was staring at my mom, like what the heck just happened? So going through that, her waking up and helping her through the recovery and being, you know, the only child that taking care of her wasn't easy and trying to get her out of that mindset because she was, um, she became paranoid with a lot of things and she became very stressed when it reaches a certain time of the day is when she had, um, when she actually had that heart attack. Mm-hmm. Every time that time comes, she has this fear, like something's going to happen to me. Mm-hmm. So for, to be on the other side of that, it wasn't, um. It, it was also hard. You yeah. know, so I could only imagine with, you know, your mom and your husband. Um, and that's, it, it is a lot of work, but out of that too is love. It is. It is. And a true partnership, right? We all have yes. to, to bring our love and respect to the table every day. And we all have to participate in it. And it certainly hasn't been easy by any stretch of the imagination, but I could only imagine how incredibly difficult my recovery would have been had I not had that support. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's that's it's unconditional love. Mm-hmm. It and, really um, is. Yeah. So my question here now is with um, trying to get up, trying to survive, and um, what was the str- what was it like for you to fight? to fight, to get up and say, I need to fight this. What was that fighting like for you? It was, it's interesting. And it's, it's uh, evolved throughout the years and it started out in abject terror, right? Because who of us wakes up one day and faces the challenge of needing to learn how to walk again and, and, and also face that fear like your mom faced where you don't know if it's going to happen again uh, you know, there's a there's a vulnerability. And I realized in the early stages, I had a lot of fear, right? I had fear about the unknown. I had fear about, do I have more ticking time bombs in my brain that are going to go off? I had fear about, will I ever walk again? I had fear about, will I ever be a professional again? Like every single thing I had a fear about. And I did in the early days have to do a fair amount of work uh, with my therapist on uh, fear motivation and, and how to take that fear and not let it paralyze me uh, and instead use it as fuel for getting better. And I, that was such an amazing lesson because it was also a great lesson for everything in life, for, for, co- for coaching, for business. Anytime I take on something new that I may not You know, we all have those insecurities about, am I good enough? Can I do this? Am I success? Can I be successful at this? And, and it made me very cognizant of when that was fear talk coming up and when it, you know, when I needed to take it and refocus it. And so in the early stages, it was getting through the fear, using it to fuel my motivation for recovery. Uh, It also was a pretty strategic endeavor where, Uh, Every day when I wasn't 
uh, either doing physical therapy or working out or doing something physical toward my recovery, I was looking for help. I was looking for resources for physical therapists who might have uh, what they call good hands in the business, um, who, who you know really just know how to look at people and know how to help them with their physical therapy. I had I sought out individuals who were doing innovative um, technology to help people who had uh, what is called hemiparesis, which or hemiplegia, which is basically one sided um, paralysis. And I looked all over the world. I looked all over the country. And so I, the, my recovery was based on a combination of mental health therapy to keep my head in the game uh, because nothing in the early days of my recovery could, could prepare me for the years that followed and how, how hard I was going to have to work uh, to just physically recover. And then later it moved toward looking for outside assistance from the amazing medical community that's out there. And then later on, it was about uh, then relaunching my life. And so the, the, how I approached it has changed throughout the years. Um, but one of the things that was interesting that happened to me about six years ago is that I started to get a lot of injuries, orthopedic injuries, and they were stress factor fractures. They were overuse injuries. They were um, kind of odd injuries that came from uh, the, the result of being paralyzed, if you will, because you lose muscle tone, you lose bone density. There are a lot of things that happen to you when you're paralyzed. And so about six or eight years ago, I started to get a lot of injury. And that has uh, that made me have to step off the train of, of all of the physical therapy work I did, which was hard. Um, and then I started to realize, wow, you know, you can't put a 40 or 50 year old body through the kind of rigors that I was putting myself through, um, you know, and not get these kind of injuries, right? So uh, as I got further, I've had to then change the way I've done the recovery to not be as aggressive, right? To, to uh, get my, to continue my recovery, yet not sideline myself with injury. And so I've had to get smarter about my recovery. So in the early stage, it was you know, get through the mental part and then by sheer brute, brute force <laughs> uh, work out. And what I mean by brute force is that there was about a six year stint where every I, about six days a week, I would start my day with a two mile swim. And then I would go to immediately to my trainer and do two hours of weight training. And then I would go for another hour of physical therapy. And then I would go for another hour of yoga. I also found this amazing machine um, called the Alter G. It was developed here in the Bay Area uh, by NASA engineers. And it's a machine. It's a treadmill that you can actually walk or run on if you're paralyzed. And it has this uh, system uh, where you're buoyed up by it. They kind of blow, they, they, the best way to describe it is they put a, a, a sort of a plastic bag over a treadmill and then you, you strap yourself into it and then they blow air into it and can reduce your weight up to 80%, 85%. So you can actually walk and run and be secure in the, in the treadmill even if you can't walk or run. And so I would go and run. Um, luckily, the people at Alter G uh, allowed me to come and use their machines. And so uh, three or four times a week, I would go and run six miles on that machine as well. And so physically, I was putting myself through the kind of training that a world-class athlete would put themselves through. And it's when you do that in, the, in your 40s and early 50s, it could have a real impact on your body. So I've had to then change how I got better and change my focus, be smarter about it. Uh, and then all along the way, I've had to continue to do work to keep my mental game going, right? Because you know, there are days when you're in the pool and you know you feel like, how can I do one more lap, right? So there's a, it's, a, it's a weariness that you have to continue to work through. And, and so that's how I've approached it is you know, continually being open to change, staying mentally focused, uh, you know, working through the fear and always looking for help. And I think if I if I stick to those, it's worked for me so far. And I'm sure there will be in the future new ways that I have to modify uh, my my um, training and modify my recovery. But uh, you know, luckily, I've had the experience I've had so far, so I'm confident in the future that I'll be able to you know continue to make those modifications to to make sure that before I lay my head down to die, that I've made as many uh, you know. 
uh, strides of recovery that I possibly can. Wow. You know what? Thank you for sharing that. And uh, how much, how can, let me phrase this question perfectly because I like to ask empowering questions, the lead questions. How much, how much of your life, I mean, the positive outlook of your life, how much of your positive outlook on life played an important value for you? I think it was really key. I really do. And I think I've, I've always been curious. Um, I've always tried to look at things in many different ways, um, you know, not just from my own point of view. And I think that played the key role because I think, like I said, um, I had to, I have to choose this every day. I have to choose recovery every day. And I do it because I know on the other side, um, there is something waiting for me and uh, that I have the support I need. And so I think the positive outlook was, it is what keeps me going every day. And it's also, by the way, one of the toughest things to maintain, you know, and I'll admit, I am not always there, right? I do have my moments when, you know, I fall into victimhood or I, you know, feel like I just can't do one more step, one more lap, one more try. Right. But I think that because I have those, it makes me remember how powerful it is to approach things positively. And so I don't reject those times when I'm feeling uh, less empowered because I know that they will, you know, they serve a purpose. So having that positive attitude is everything. Wow. Where do you find that positive attitude all the time? Uh, yeah. And I don't, right. <laughs> I don't. And I think that's the point. Right. And we learn that in coaching, right. There are times when I just I just make it okay to sit in it, right? I give myself permission uh, to have those times where I'm just, you know, ticked off and feeling sorry for myself and feeling like I'll never get better. And it's ironically, this has been really consistent throughout the last 15 years. And that is, you know, on the times where I'm feeling at my worst is on the other side of that is when I have my most impactful recovery. And so I think there is something really powerful about allowing yourself to just be in it, right? With a lot, without a lot of pressure to, to change that way of thinking, because eventually it will cross over um, it, as long as you trust it and you trust yourself and you trust that you will find your way back. It's funny that you said that. I struggled with allowing yourself this week, <laughs> just allowing yourself to feel the feelings. Mm -hmm. I had that struggle this week and it is, it is very hard. It's not it's not an easy thing to do, but it takes practice. Yeah. And I'm sure you know that. And that's, you know, just what you're going through and just always trying to stay positive and changing that mindset. I can't, gosh, I can't even imagine, you know, and I know that there's times that you'd probably like what you said, want, just want to give up. Like ever thought of like, why, why am I even doing this? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, to what end is it, right? Those are those yeah. days where you don't know or not, you know, whether you can go another step. But I also, um, I, I'm grateful for all of the resources that we have, right? Coaching is an amazing modality that helps you to, you know, sort of be with yourself and allow yourself that time and to meet yourself where you are, right? And, and to assure yourself you're exactly where you need to be. And that has helped me a lot. Uh, and I also, uh, luckily, I studied philosophy when I was in college. And I'm a huge fan, um, not fan, but I, I really do appreciate the, the stoic area uh, eras where we had philosophers who, you know, helped us to just be with our own thoughts. Uh, I, I, there's a, an amazing book I read uh, halfway through my recovery, I don't know if you've ever heard of this author, a fellow by the name of Ryan Holiday, who wrote a book called Daily The Stoic. Obstacle. Ron, Ron reads a lot of that. Do you? Have you read The Obstacle is the Way? Uh, so I, I read two of Obstacles the Way as I read it during when the pandemic hit. And I need that kind of book because, you know, when the pandemic hit last year, uh, the first um, area of businesses that were hit were gyms for sure. Uh, nail salons, hairstylists, and and movies. And um, in my case, you know, those that own a business, oh, you're out, pretty much I'm out of business. 
as soon as the gym closed down and started prolonging after two weeks, three weeks, three months, four months, after the first two weeks, you're feeling very deflated because you got to think about it. Um, depending on what your value is in life, but the value is you guys still got to pay your mortgage, you still got to pay your rent, still got to pay your bills, even though the gyms are shut down, what do you do? So reading that book actually gave me, it's a small little uh, five inch by seven inch book. It's really small. And um, it gave me an avenue to for hope and how mm-hmm. to look at th- things a different perspective. Um, he also bought one of his books called The Daily Stoic, which is basically you read a chapter a day from a stoic out there that I also read. So I've read both to answer your question. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it, it was really wonderful and because he has this great way of taking a sort of very complex writings of people like Marcus Aurelius and putting it into everyday terms that, that really are, that can resonate with us, right? And I think one of the reasons I resonated with it is that recovering from paralysis has a very uh, Sisyphean nature, right? You do feel a lot like Sisyphus where you're always trying to push the, you know, the huge boulder up the mountain and, you know, you're taking three steps forward and two steps back. And that's very much like the recovery process. And so, you know, having, you know, that acknowledgement that the obstacle is the way, right? Like, don't, don't be afraid when you have that huge boulder in front of you. And, you know, you, you just need to embrace it because you will find a way through it, over it, around it. And, and if you don't, it's okay. What can you learn from it? Right. And so I think there's a lot of that that helps to write me, right. It helps that mental game um, while I'm struggling with the physical side. Wow. I just, um, when you said, remember what you've learned from it, it's what I've learned this week on that is just to remember the lesson and not the, not the disappointment. Yes. Yes. That's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that reminds me of, of, you know, when I read the book, I thought about that boulder because when the pandemic hit, that boulder's right then there. You, 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 I can't see through it. But eventually, what's kind of ironic about life is I figure a way around it. And what had happened is that I had two choices, really. I can sit here and twiddle my thumbs and wait for Gavin Newsom to back up and see what happens. And the gym really didn't open back up. It shut down March 17th and then opened back up to July because I was uh, pretty much a contractor outside this gym. So I trained my clients there, paying my monthly fees, and that's how I pretty much got paid. Um, so the gym almost didn't open, open up for like for four months. So open up in July for like one day and it closed on the next day because the pandemic mm-hmm. numbers went up. But in that case, so I had two choices. I can sit there and twiddle my thumbs and wait for the governor to open up. Or I can say, okay, I have this garage. What's available at my hand? What can I get a hold of? And how can I start training my clients? What can I do? How can I, how can I pivot? And, um, that's why I realized that Boulder was there to actually get me to the next way. Because mm-hmm. if the pandemic didn't happen, if I didn't set gym up, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. I pretty much have quit doing training with the exception of a few clients I still train virtually. So I'm embracing my full on life coaching business and doing that because that's where I find most happiness. Training was great. And I would say it's, it's really a means to an end. And what I mean by that is that it allowed me to quit my full-time job, which I hated. I did training for a few years. Uh, I'm still doing it now. So like four years, five years, five years of the training. And now it's like I'm doing something completely different. And this what I'm doing, I, it's much more in a flow. I don't feel no resistance. Mm-hmm. And it's really huge for me that. So it was a really good book to get over what we're facing, especially this pandemic. I mean, a lot of businesses went belly up. There's a few trainers that I know that I know had to quit, didn't, can't, couldn't go back to training because they needed to pay the bills. So they had to start a full-time job. A lot of the trainers um, started converting a garage and at that garage into a training facility. People are doing outside training. They're trying to do something to earn income. And uh, it just really changed, but gave me an alignment, gave me in a better alignment with my purpose in life and my true passion. Mm-hmm. And that's really what's um, happened for me. So I have one question for you. Um, one last thing, and I think this is very important. I'll tell you why. What's your sense of control in your situation? It's interesting you touch on that, Ron, because one of the things I learned early on in this process uh, with the help of a great therapist is um, 
I certainly do have some control drama issues, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I started to embrace the fact that there were a couple of things I needed to work through. First one was uh, the control issue where I really felt it important for me to be in control. And I, I, I had a lot of great um, therapy, but I also uh, continued to work on this through the coaching training we went through where we're forced to also take a look at ourselves and I did realize, you know, where that came from, but I also realized I needed some time to work on that and that this would give me an opportunity to work on letting go of needing to be in control all the time. And that, I'll be honest, I continue to work on that uh, as I go through this crazy process, but I've let it go a lot, a lot. And I think how I've done it is I have a true desire to be present as well. And and if you're holding on to wanting to be in control and being so distracted by that, it's really hard to just settle in and be present in your life. And, and because I think that's really important, I continue to work on it. So I, I won't say I'm completely through all of my control issues, but I am chipping away at them every day. And I certainly have a lot of opportunity to do that. The second thing that I realized is um, patience. I don't have a lot of patience. I didn't have a lot of patience. And this whole experience has certainly taught me about uh, being patient, uh, letting, letting things go the way they need to go, not trying to control them, right? So the two, you can see, go really hand in hand. And th this has made me very conscious of that. Um, and so I can truly say, Ron, I don't feel in control of anything. <laughs> and, and that's okay. <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> yeah. And it's and not the reason, a bad thing. No, it's not at all. And the reason why I ask these questions is as part of um, so I got my CPC last year, certified professional coach, and I got my ACC uh, no December of last year, so just less than a year ago. And also I became NLP certified and I'm onto a new thing called positive psychology practitioner. So new avenue of something and it's a 12 module online, which is great. So I just finished a module on resilience. And in this module, the guy's name is Michael Unger. He talks about there's 12 steps to building resilience. And the first step to building resilience is positive thinking. The second step to, to building resilience is structure. Third, accountability. Uh, fourth, love for mothers. Fifth, supportive relationships. Uh, sixth, powerful identity. Seventh, sense of control. Eighth, belonging to a culture. Um, ninth, rights and responsibility. Tenth, basic needs. Eleventh, physical well-being. And twelfth, financial well-being. And it's funny talking to you on this podcast. You kind of hit, you know, if you look at a clock, you kind of hit all hours all on this because you have the structure, you have the family. The most important thing is you have a sense of I will make it. And however that looks out for you is different. Um, and then you have accountability. I still have to show up. I can't just allow this to happen to me. Mm -hmm. And you had support. Your basic needs were met. So that's how you're able to beat it. And when I heard this from Michael Unger, I was like, man, wow. Listen to your story and look at these steps. He is right. At least, at least in one aspect, right, about being, building resilience. Yeah, you're absolutely right. What was number six again? Oh. Number six was, uh, hold on, look at it again, sense of control. Yeah, yeah, got it. Interesting. Sense of control. And the sense of control can be, you know what, I'm in control of the fact I can get better. I'm in control of how I feel. I'm in control, like you say, I'm in control of the present moment. So... Once you, if people say, ah, I, I, I'm not in control. Like, you know, I always think about this. Life has two effects, cause and effect. You're the cause of your situation or you're effect of it. Most people live by the rule, I'm effect of it. So this happened to me, so I can't do nothing else. Or it can be like, well, I'm the cause of it. I mean, in your case, it may not be the aneurysm. It may, may or may not have caused I'm not for sure. But if you get that better sense of control and that you can change your life and you have the control, it gives you overall well-being, so that way you progressively start moving forward in different steps and avenues of your life. Yeah, yeah. Or it's like, or if this this happened to me, so that's it. I can't do anything about it. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. that's wow. right. That's right. Yeah. And you know, I think one of the one of the most devastating and empowering things that can happen to a person, or I should say, for me anyway, was when I was sitting in that hospital room and I realized there's no way through this, but to get through the eye of the needle. You know what I mean? Like I can't outsource this recovery, right? We, we, in certain ways in society, we've come to this place where we want to outsource everything or we want to, you know, make the solution easy. And I, I had this real uh, devastating realization that I was the only one who could, um, you know, drive this, this journey that I'm on and that the only way I was going to get better is if I owned it and I showed up for it and I drove it and I demanded it of myself. And that was devastating and empowering at the same time, right? Because it makes you realize it, it is really about everything in your life, right? Things do happen to us, but we do have a choice of how we look at it. And that in itself is the control, right? Our control is to control how we feel about it and how we react to it. And that's about all we can do. And I think that was an incredible lesson. It all starts with you. Mm -hmm. Change comes from within. It does. It does. And that's kind of our, our glorified model on our YouTube. I'm putting on my YouTube channel and also my Facebook and um, LinkedIn. Change comes within. And that brings me to a, a point which I'd like to – I'm going to break it down by two two very important questions. I'll go with the first question for you, Patty. Someone that's listening to this podcast that is either going through it or experiencing it from a friend, family member, what are kind of some three or four – steps that can help recovery from themselves or for the loved ones? That's a good question. I don't know if I could answer it from the loved one standpoint, except to guess at it from what I've seen, what is modeled for me for my loved ones. But uh, I can certainly say for people who might be going through something like this, whether it's physical or mental or something happening with family, uh, is I think to remember that that there are always other options and that you truly do. You are the steward and the captain of your own life. And, you know, there are always going to be challenges and obstacles in the way. And whether you know it or not, you have it in you to find the answers, to get through them around them, or just stop and learn from them and embrace them. And I think if you can remember at the times when you feel the most disempowered, that you do actually have the power and the control to create empowerment for yourself. And to do it, it's different for everyone, but I'm hoping that people can hear from me that it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to look for people to help you through your journey and to lean on people. And hopefully if you don't have them in your life right now, you'll be motivated to go and find them um, because that's in your power as well. And I think the other thing is, uh, you know, and I know this sounds so cliche, but, you know, truly never give up. Give yourself permission to rest, but don't ever give up because you really can achieve the most amazing things. I mean, when I was told in the hospital, you'll never walk again, uh, that was pretty devastating. And I am walking again and I'm functioning again. And, and had I listened to the doctors at that time, I may not have been where I'm at right now. So don't always listen to what people say. Truly follow your gut and know that you have it in you, like we've been talking about today, to create the kind of outcome that you want. I love that. Okay, so my biggest last question. If everybody that's guessing the podcast, I always tell them, one to five sentences, what is one takeaway our guests or an audience can learn from you? Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know how qualified I am to give that kind of advice to people uh, because, you know, certainly my own experience is my own and I wouldn't, you know, be as bold to think that it would apply to everybody else. Um, but I think it would be uh, to just remember we're pretty powerful beings and that we hold that power within ourselves and that it's our choice completely what we decide to do with it. 
And I hope people will use their powers for good for themselves and to care for themselves. And that is really the most important thing is self-care. And I, I think that's where it all starts. Amen to that. I love it. And I always ask us that because I hope for you this experience on this podcast gives you a chance to heal yourself because you're now unboxing your story and expressing others. Um, the biggest thing I my takeaway from you personally was the fact that change is hopeful and I hold the key to my everlasting life, whatever that is. And that's the biggest thing. So that's my biggest takeaway from listening to your podcast, uh, Patty. So I want to say thank you for the bottom of my heart and thank you for sharing your story. Um, this was marvelous. It, it touched my heart because my dad went through the similar kind of issue you went through. Um, and it tells me that there's hope and there's hope in your personal self. Actually, hope comes with hope and faith comes within, but hope for humanity and hope for people out there. And I want to say again, thank you for being a guest on our podcast and thank you for our audience for listening to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. Yeah. And again, for me, I think at the end of this is what I said earlier that um, my take on this is it all starts with you. Yes, you'll have all the support. Yes, you'll have all the help and the resources, but it still all comes down to you. You'd have to really want it and you'd have, you'd want to want that change. And like what we said, change comes from within. And again, Patty, thank you for um, joining us and sharing your wonderful story. Very inspiring. Um, and this is Gloria, Mindfulness and Meditation Coach. And thank you for listening to another episode of Life's a Shuffle.